but we never had an insight into any other experience. Now for the first time, we see his conquering power in a most formidable foe. You can conquer sin in a sense, but you and I have never once faced the devil one on one. You and I have never had the privilege of having Satan say to his demons, I'll take over from here. Satan didn't send any of his arch people. He never sent any of his angels. He said, I am going to go. He knew his foe was so strong that he himself had to go. <coughs> and that's not all. In the future, as he defeated Satan, he did something else. In the future, he will come as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Returning to earth, at, at which point he will conquer all ungodliness. He will conquer all ungodliness. He will destroy all unredeemed sinners. He will send them to the lake of fire. And he will send all demons to the lake of fire. He will send the beast and the false prophet, the Antichrist, and the hitchman to the lake of fire. He will send the devil himself to the lake of fire. He will then destroy the sin-stained universe. He will literally go up into an atomic holocaust. The elements will melt with fervent heat in its plates. And he will recreate a new heaven and a new earth on holiness and righteousness along which will last forever. This will be the final conquest of Jesus Christ. But it started in the wilderness. The proof that Jesus Christ can conquer not only the devil, but sin and everything that God has, Satan has ever done, he is going to do it because we see it here in chapter 4 of Luke. So, you see, what happened here in the temptation is only a foretaste of what is coming through all of the great events in the life and ministry of the King, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. It's as if the guarantee of his future conquering was established in the event of the temptation in the wilderness. We're going to see that Satan tempts Jesus not in a superficial way, but Satan is going to tempt Jesus in the area that it could be his most vulnerable. You know, it is possible that when Satan tempts us, he doesn't tempt us in areas that we have, we have, we, that we're, that we have already conquered. I don't know that Satan really knows us. I don't think Satan knows me. He probably knows Billy Graham pretty well. But he certainly don't know me. Who am I? I mean, if he causes me to fall from grace, hello, he probably sends one of his third grade <laughs> low level rookie demon on his first test to see how well he does causing a person to fall and he says hey Sammy I want you to go tempt that person and see if you can get him out but God son Jesus Christ Satan says I think maybe I should go now Satan is a spirit all demons and angels are spirit. 
how he appeared in the wilderness, I don't know. But he has the ability, apparently, to take on as an angel of light. So he went into the garden. We'll see about that as we go forward. Let me read the text again to you. And let's see, I think we are, and let's see. And being, verse 1, notice if you will, let's read together with this. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Then forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when there they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory over them, for that he delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thou. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shalt thou serve. And Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. Not only is this proof of and guarantee of Jesus' power, but as I said before, it is also the evidence that he is, in fact, the Son of God. When a person makes fun of the person Jesus, as we learned this morning, when people make fun, when people in those days made fun of Israel, they indeed were making fun of God. And when you make fun of God's family, he takes it personally because he placed himself in Israel and he knew them, and as we said this morning, he knew them, meaning that he became intimately acquainted with them. I know all of you on probably a superficial level. Correct? I know who you are, but I don't know that I know you. And I don't spend all my time at your house. God came to live with his people. And when Christ came to know you, he came to live in your house. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit, and that's where Christ dwells in your life. He is the Son of God. It is evident that He is, in fact, the Son of God. And you remember that in a prior event to this, which is indicated to us in the chapter 3, notice verse 21 and 22, Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by John. And at the time of His baptism, His Father said in verse 22, look what it says, Thou art my beloved Son, in Thee I am well pleased. And God affirmed Jesus as the Son, His Son. Now this is a momentous statement by God. That is not a common statement. This is a uncommon statement. This is absolutely unique. And I 
have pointed out to you that already that Luke has let us know that Jesus is the Son of God. Back, of course, in chapter 1. Can you remember that part back? When the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, The Son whom you will bear, you will call his name Jesus. Chapter 1, verse 31 says, and then, that's in verse 31, and verse 32, He will be great, and He will call, He will be called the Son of the Most High, the Son of the Almighty God, the Son of God, verse 35. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason, the holy offering shall be called the Son of God. Then in chapter 2, in verse 40, Jesus affirms that he had to be his father's house. He said when he was 12 years old, I need to be doing what my father tells me to do. And then in fact, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So I think by the time we get to chapter 4, we get this idea that indeed Jesus Christ is indeed God in the flesh. So already, as we know, that this is the Son of God, and I hope by the time we've gone through 29 lessons that you come convinced in your heart that God has made His appearance on earth and indeed He is Christ. Now maybe just a bit background. Jesus is called the Son of God about 80 times. And your assignment this week is to find out those 80 times. Uh -huh. yeah. right. It's very common title for Jesus about 80 times. 54 times in the first three Gospels and over 100 times for a total of 154 times in the four Gospels Jesus speaks of God as his Father. And I would suggest as, you, as you're reading the New Testament, every time, get your little notebook out, as you give, give you something to enjoy reading. When you read the Gospels, just note the number of times that Jesus is referred to as God. So this is a very, very common expression. Son of God and Jesus referring to God as his Father. Now, let me just tell you, this is a very remarkable thing. For Jesus to claim to be the Son of God was very remarkable. For him to be called God, my Father, was remarkable. It expresses eternal deity. It expressed the sameness of nature as we have told you in the past. He was God. But let me put it in, let me, let me, let me, let me try to put this in perspective. Two times in the Old Testament, two times in the 39 books, of the entire Bible, and this week I want you to find those two times. Hey, by the way, somebody know what's the answer? Frankie, I think you gave it to me this morning. Peter said what? Out, out. What was the question? <laughs> what was the question this morning? Who quoted Joah? 